Good morning. This is a very important morning. It's a calendar event in the School of Education, and it is our annual breakfast meeting with our school principals. This event is very important for us as a school because it forms, it represents a part of the core business of the School of Education. And that is the business of teacher professional development. So this morning, I'm here to welcome you as the director of the school. My name is Marcia Rainford. And I want to specially indicate at this time that this function that we have been having for a number of years is really the brainchild of a colleague, Diane McCallum, who through her research and through her advocacy have brought this, this activity to this point this year. We want to also recognize the work of one of our key administrators in this program, that is Ms. Rosemary Campbell, who has been a part of the practicum unit in the school and who has really worked tremendously to get this function on this morning. And recently, I think Rosemary has been joined by Ms. Tricia Bailey. So we want to salute the practicum unit in the School of Education for this function primarily. And we're just here to support the work that is being done by that unit. This morning, we want to indicate that our purpose here is sort of twofold. It's twofold because as a school and a part of the Faculty of Humanities in Education, we have our purpose, our main purpose, as I said, to prepare teachers for the system. As such, we take the business of professional development very seriously. But we are also a part of the faculty, and we are also concerned about what's happening with respect to the humanities in the system as a whole. And so our function this morning, the theme, schooling and the future, Preparation for life, work, and learning over the lifespan captures that, those two purposes. The business of looking at the practicum and understanding what it is and why we are doing this, but also to look more broadly at the role of the humanities in shaping our students and the future society. And so in that context, I want to welcome the number of stakeholders who are brought together this morning for that purpose. So in this room, we have brought together our primary stakeholders, our school principals, and a number of our teachers who are here as cooperating teachers who, who over the many years have served to support our teachers in the system when they go out there. So we have cooperating teachers, we have principals from a number of schools, and Dr. McCallum is going to make mention of the number of schools and where our cooperating teachers are from this morning when she speaks a little later. But before she comes, I just want you to just acknowledge the principals and the cooperating teachers from the various schools who are here with us at this time. So we have said that our schools are our major stakeholders. We also have the Minister of Education here, represented by Dr. Tamika Benjamin, who is a National Mathematics Coordinator and Treasury Support Officer in the, school, in the Ministry of Education. And she's representing here the Chief Education Officer. Now, the, it is important that the Ministry is seen as a part of this process because we work through them through the schools to train our teachers. And so Dr. Benjamin is here this morning to give us some insights from the perspective of the ministry as to how they can support our practicum. Mm -hmm. we, want to, we want to also welcome in a special way Mrs. Esther Tyson, who is a past student of the School of Education, and she's here to, in her role as an advocate for the humanities and, and certainly one who is going to end and in her capacity as a past principal of uh, at the high school, St. Andrew High School for Girls. And she's here because, 
Arden, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Esther, I'm sorry. It's Arden, um, it's Arden. I, sh I should know this, right? And 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 um, and to, and to hear, but here because she's such an important past principal, and one who I think all of her colleagues um, respect, and we thought of no better person to who could share the perspective of the school's perspective and the principal's perspective to lead that session than Mrs. Tyson. So we welcome Mrs. Tyson. Now teaching is a, is a profession, of course, and many times we, we, even we ourselves don't see teachers in the way that we ought to. Sometimes we think of disciplines like medicine and all of that, and we think, oh, these people have, it, have got it all together. And we wanted to, Diane wanted to, in, a part, in, in, a, in, in, in today's session, she wanted to really show the links between um, preparing professionals in the context for teaching as, a, as well as for professions that we so esteem such as medicine. And so this morning we have our guest speaker who is, <laughs> she also has links with the School of Education, but I will leave that for when she comes later. She's Dr. Annette Crawford Sykes and she's a medical pro practitioner and she is a dean for student success in the Faculty of Medical Sciences. And I said that, and it has links with the School of Education because yeah, when she was thinking of going into teaching in, um, in medicine, she thought, oh God, I need to know something. And so she came over to us and we have a link from that perspective. So, so she's going to share with us about how we prepare medics and make that link between the importance of preparing teachers and preparing the doctors. So that's, in a nutshell, persons who are stakeholders from sort of outside of the school or sort of the faculty. But this morning, we also have with us, for the first time, not just our dean, Professor Wariboko, who is sitting right here, but we also have the faculty, the heads of the, the various departments in the, in the faculty. And I want to introduce them, and I want to ask them to just stand so that we can see who they are. So we have from the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures, Dr. Nina Bruni, who is our head. <laughs> Department of Language, Linguistics and Philosophy, Dr. Ingrid McLaren. <laughs> our head of Department of Literatures in English, Dr. Rachel Mosley, who is not here, but is represented by Mrs. Lisa Brown. Department of History and Archaeology, Dr. Enrique Okenvi. <laughs> Department of Library and Information Studies, Dr. Rosemary Heath. <laughs> Institute of Caribbean Studies, Dr. Naya, is she here? Oh, I think it's Sonia. <laughs> Dr. Sonia Naya. The Caribbean School of Media and Communication, Dr. Livingston White. And representing the Jamaica Language Unit and also Deputy Dean for Graduate Studies, Dr. Joseph Farkerson. I have already mentioned the Dean, but perhaps you don't know him. Professor Waraboko, could you please stand so that we can all see you? That's our Dean. And we have Deputy Dean Nicole Plummer is here as well. Thanks, Dean. Other colleagues from the faculty, from the School of Education are in the room. So we have faculty members and they are seated in strategically at tables. You'll get to know them. We want to introduce everyone. everyone. But I want to especially identify an, a colleague who is visiting on sabbatical this year. Um, she is Professor Hazel Carter. She's sitting right there. Welcome her from you. And she's with us for a year, and she has been really a true inspiration, and we are happy to have her. So this morning, as I have said, is our annual breakfast meeting with school principals. And I want to just say that this morning, we really want to have a round table session, one in which you'll get to talk 
with each other and out of this I think we will come away with some solid good recommendations about how to strengthen teaching and learning but in particular how to balance the program in our schools to allow for a stronger focus on the humanities. That said, it is now time for me to ask Dr. Bramwell Leila to come to ask God's blessing on this function as well as on the meal which will follow directly after the prayer. Good morning, colleagues. I invite you to join me as we pause for this time of meditation. All children have a right to quality education. Education is invaluable in assisting children in fulfilling their God-given potential. In recent times, we have been steadily bombarded by a range of issues operating against the education system, and the children in particular. According to Dion Edwards Kerr, the interaction between students and their context, such as the school and the community, are key in helping to shape their identities. Violence in homes, communities, and schools have impacted children. Children fed a daily diet of violence in Jamaica is the headline of a 2017 UNICEF article by Alison Brown. The article continues. The cases are in the news almost every day. A child beaten with a machete, a child murdered brutally, a child sexually assaulted. And the news scars for 2020 have so far shown that this trend may likely continue. Crises in children's lives can leave them being unable to complete an education, which would be a breach of their rights, as well as impact their future. Treat the youth right instead of putting up a fight is a well-known anthem by Jamaican musician Jimmy Cliff. A sentiment that is similarly echoed in the scriptures in St. Matthew 19 verse 14, where Jesus firmly says to his disciples, who are trying to block the children from him, let the children come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are like these children. This passage is a wonderful affirmation of the value of children and the role that adults and the system should play in their lives. We should assist the children. Don't put barriers in their way that will block their development. The imagery of children likens the kingdom of heaven to those among us who are vulnerable, who seem unimportant, who lack value and experience, those who are trusting, innocent, vulnerable, and dependent. The imagery of the value and importance of children, which is the will of God and modeled by Jesus, leads us to reflect on the role of education in our country today. What are the roles of schools in determining students' present and future quality of life? How is the Education Act, which governs our system of education and was designed more than 50 years ago, relevant to the current and the future education climates? Or is our education system one of the barriers facing our nation's children, preventing them from fulfilling their gifts and abilities? Watch what you teach the little children. Make sure there's something to hurt them, says another Jamaican musician, Tony Rebel. Unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 18, verse 3. Unless we train and work for the development and well-being of children, we will be operating outside of the will of God for our lives and our children. May God help us to be faithful then to our calling. Let us pray. Gracious God, 
as members of the education sector, we meet today to contemplate the theme, schooling and the future, preparation for life, work, and learning over the lifespan. We acknowledge you as a creator of children with their varying qualities. And so we ask that you will help us as educators and administrators to put systems in place that will equip every student with opportunities to fulfill their gifts and abilities and their studies. We ask that you equip our institutions with all that is needed to carry out their duties on behalf of our nation's children. We ask for your blessing on the organizers and the gathering of this morning's proceedings. May the, co the conversations we hold be meaningful and be pleasing to you. We ask for your blessing on the meal that we will share and may it be a reminder of your constant provision to us. We thank you for hearing our prayers and we ask all these in the name of our Lord and Savior. Amen. Thanks, Sharon. At this time, we're going to have breakfast served. I think um, it's going to be a buffet, and I will direct you as to the order. But during the breakfast session, we're going to have a video presentation so you could get to know each other at the table, but you should also get a sense of who are some of the persons who you have at the table through the video presentation and then we'll follow after breakfast. Um, we will take about 20 minutes, I think, um, from now to when we resume for the to follow our program, and um, we'll go like that. As I reflected on what I needed to share this morning and read the brief and all of the other things that was sent to the ministry, I ended up in a conversation with I don't want to take um, credit for this quote, with my husband, who is also an educator. And he made a statement that has been ringing in my ears since about five o'clock this morning. Um, he said, it takes a village to raise a child, and it takes a system to train a teacher. And so I've been thinking about it because the Ministry of Education on its own can't train teachers and teacher training institutions on their own will not be able to effectively train a teacher. Let me put that word in. And schools on their own will not be able to do that either. Everybody has to participate in this process of preparing effective teachers for the future. And this process of preparing the teacher is what, what, what I think it's, it's, it's an ongoing process. Um, we tend to think it ends when we graduate and we get that piece of paper in our hands. But the truth is that the pre-service component is just the beginning. If you're really going to be an excellent educator, that's really just the beginning of the process. And that lays the foundation for what else, whatever else is going to come. Schools then have to tip in and provide mentorship for new teachers to ensure that they can transition from the, that degree program to the everyday life of being an educator and shaping the lives of students. It's, for me, education is more than just what I teach, but it's also the interactions with our students that help to shape them into the whole being that they ought to be. And then our schools also, along with the ministry and, and along with the teacher training institutions, have to find a way to provide opportunities for continued professional development of the teacher. And for me, it's not just the teacher in the classroom, but also school leaders. Because oftentimes in the mix, we, we focus on the teachers in the classroom, but we forget that our school leaders are instructional leaders. And even as the training takes place for teachers and those opportunities are created, we have to do the same for our school leaders. So the Ministry of Education is just one of the critical partners in the process. As I reflected, I also thought about, and, and somehow I really didn't pay attention, although I should have, to who your speaker was. But one of the things that came to my mind is, 
their teacher teaching is one of the professions that clinical practice is critical to. Doctors and nurses also have to do it. And I'm sure there are, there are others, but those jumped out at me. Partially because we would, re we would probably all hesitate to go to a doctor who was on his first day um, on the job and never ever had any practice of any kind. And we were the very first patient they were interacting with. If any of us knew that, we would probably t think twice before we allowed that doctor to engage us. And yet, unfortunately, many of us in, in the education, in education, even though we have benefited from it, don't throw ourselves behind the clinical practice and create the opportunities in our schools for potential teachers to practice. And I always say, we must think of that student teacher in front of us as the teacher of our future children, if we don't have any yet, or grandchildren, or nieces or nephews. This is someone who will likely impact you, directly or indirectly. And it is therefore all of our responsibilities to ensure that they become the best they can be. So having said all of that, I just want to reinforce some things that we all know. It is through the clinical practice that our teachers, our student teachers, get an opportunity to link the theory and the practice and to engage it in a way that can't engage in a lecture theater. Um, some things will never be learned if, unless I'm doing it, unless I'm interacting with those ideas and principles. And so it's very important that we find a way to not only create the spaces, but also strengthen the capabilities of persons within the school system to support it. So it's more than just a space for the student to go and the teacher disappears when it's teaching time. It's for the teacher, the cooperating teacher, to understand that his or her presence in the room is also a very important part of helping that student teacher to develop into an effective teacher. And so the engagement with the schools for me, for the ministry is more than just finding the spaces, but helping those persons on the ground to understand that they have a very important part to play in that process. So while the ministry doesn't have a written policy, and I'm going to add the word as yet. And I added it because I said to a PS this morning, I think we need to get to that stage. So let's see what she says. She hasn't answered me yet. <laughs> that was by WhatsApp. So I'm going to say as yet, because this is a dialogue that has been taking place. And I think in the last three to four years in particular, the ministry's eyes have zoned in in a new way on our teacher training institutions. Um, and so there is, there, we, there is a great awareness of the fact that if we don't build and support the work you do, we will always be playing catch up on the, on the other end of the, this, of the game. So there are some small steps that have been taken. And so the first thing I want to say is from the perspective of the ministry, the clinical practice, the teaching in practice is a very important um, component in the process and we support it wholeheartedly. So we know, and I read what was sent, that many institutions, not just the University of the West Indies, but many institutions struggle sometimes to place students in schools. And I would want to say, as I have said in other contexts, that this is an opportunity for you to form a partnership with the ministry to support you in the process. Whether it is learning, the per knowing the persons who are in the regional offices close to the schools you work in so that we can help. Um, we have been helping when we know there is an issue. So if you are facing a challenge and you have students you are not able to place and you want somebody to help to encourage a school to participate, let us know. And we will be willing to partner with you on that. So no policy yet, but we're willing to, to walk with you um, in that regard. There are other things the ministry is doing, and I think this is one thing that can we can have dialogue on. In the whole process of trying to develop systems and policies or, or strategies to respond to 
the, ha the, the migration of teachers, particularly those in certain subject areas. There is an allowance now for persons who are in their final year, I don't know if you are aware, persons who are in their final year who are go going on practice um, to actually be paid a pre-trained teachers. Um, and so that's something that I think the School of Education can engage the ministry in understanding how that works, because that might be, make, make this route more attractive to many of your students. But one of the things I would want to say, it also has a benefit for schools. So I've always encouraged the principals who I interface with to take teaching practice students. For the, it, the benefits to the school are so many. One, in this period where we, are, we have limited numbers, you have first pick. You're actually able to interview a potential candidate in a way you never will be able to do by just having a face-to-face -face engagement. Because you're seeing the person, you're not just seeing their, their skills and competences as it relates to teaching, but you can see their, their work ethic on display. You can f determine whether this person, um, their, their values are consistent with your school and your vision for your school. And so there are so many benefits to a school. It offers, it offers your teachers an opportunity to enrich their own practice and engagement, moving just from it, speaking and, and working with the students, but helping to build another teacher. And so I want to congratulate the schools that are here and the schools that continue to support not just the University of the West Indies School of Education, but all of the other teacher training institutions in placing students and receiving students and supporting student teachers i want to say congratulations to you and encourage you to continue and if you have taken one or two maybe next year you go three or four there is a myth that you know the student teacher is a interruption to teaching and learning and it is a myth it is a myth because from my experience most times they go above and beyond what those of us who are 10 years and five years in, but we've become so used to it, they go above and beyond. And many times I find they enrich the experience for the students and add value to the school. So I think we need to debunk that myth and encourage more and more of our schools to be willing, principals who are present, use your associations as a means to encourage your, your colleagues to welcome your students, the, the teaching practice students, into their schools. So, as I wrap up, I'm not a long speaker. Just to reinforce, um, as we take the steps towards building that, prof that policy, and I'm speaking it, believing that we're gonna get there, I look forward to engaging persons from the School of Education policy is not something we sit in a room and do, but it involves the engagement of stakeholders on the ground in putting that into place and making, making sure that that becomes a reality. Uh, we, we commit to providing the support to placing students where there are challenges and to supporting whatever capacity building opportunities you need to create to ensure that this works to the benefit of our education system. So as I close, I just want to remind us again that while it takes a village to raise a child, it takes a system to effectively train a teacher. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Benjamin. And some of the words that you said were really music to our ears in the School of Education. We will certainly take you up on that. And I'm just trusting that you know, as colleagues, we will share this sort of message with our other colleague principals and vice principals so that we can truly make this education system what we really, really want it to be. Thanks again, Dr. Benjamin. Um, our dean, Professor Wariboko, had to leave. He had another engagement. And so he's not going to present to you now, but we do have his able representative, Dr. Joseph Farkerson, who is going to come now and say something to us on the other purpose why we're here this morning. Come, Joseph, please.
Okay, so I thank Drs. Rainford and Benjamin for observing the protocols, which will allow me to just say good morning, colleagues. Good morning. Okay, so education needs a time machine. And I'm using time machine because it is still fiction. Um, but at one point in time, so were elevators, so were aeroplanes, so were motor vehicles, etc. But here we are today with all of those things. Will we have time machines soon? Um, I don't know. But coming up with the idea of a time machine, just like for an aeroplane, an elevator, etc., requires a particular type of mind, a mind that is not so much worried about the engineering of the whole thing, but the idea that something can exist to serve a particular purpose. And then that mind can leave it to somebody else to work out the nuts and bolts. Um, this is where the humanities is placed, uh, are placed. We don't have time machines. And so there are about three points that I'd like to deal with today, which can help us to compensate for the lack of time machine. Why am I using time machine? This is because education involves a set of people who have been trained in the past, trying to prepare people for inhabiting a future that none of them have ever experienced. A time machine would have been good for getting us there, but since we do not have one, first, educators need to be open-minded open-minded about the possibilities that are out there and what sort of things, um, jobs, opportunities can exist in a particular society. And so I was disturbed, um, happy but still disturbed by the Prime Minister's announcement that they would set up several STEM schools. I said, okay, STEM schools are, are good, but where are the schools for the arts? And why was this term? Not because there is no need for a focus on STEM subjects and STEM areas, but having foregrounded STEM, it ignored the exact area in which Jamaica has its strengths, which is the creative arts the humanities uh, more broadly. So if we think about many of the things and people that Jamaica is famous for, if we think about the philosopher Marcus Garvey, if we think about the folklorist and performer Louise Bennett Coverley, if we think about uh, um, the singer and songwriter Bob Marley, um, whose birth, yes, whose birthday is today, I'm mean, reminded. These are all people inhabiting the humanities, not STEM. And they are the ones who have placed Jamaica's name on the map, which means that we ignore the humanities to our own detriment. So educators have to be open-minded about what is out there. And how do you do that? When you guide students, you have to be able to unfold for them all of the possibilities that exist. A lot of um, children choose their career paths as early as ninth grade, very early. Um, many of them are pushed into science subjects because they show an aptitude for book learning. So you're bright, you should go and do the sciences. And many of them do well up to CSEC, up to CAPE. But then when they come to university, and this is now from my experience interacting with students over many years, they start to fail. So we have received, um, in my discipline, in linguistics, lots of students who for two or so years in science and technology were getting all Fs. Because somebody thought that you are bright you should do the natural sciences. 
and then they move over to the humanities and these students many of them become straight A students not because the humanities are easy and anybody here who um, has been through a humanities education will know in fact many of them tell me and this i'll have to say quietly um, that they do not get the same sort of instruction elsewhere as they do in the humanities in that they are forced to think i'm not going to say what that says about elsewhere so we have to remain open-minded about how we guide um, students. Yes, we need the engineers. Yes, we need the doctors. Yes, we need. But there are lots of things that are happening in the world that will call for philosophers. So for example, the, the booming sports industry, um, the booming construction industry, and the need for people who have an understanding of areas such as ethics. Um, so there was a complaint the other day, um, I think when they had the, um, the meeting on um, Kingston High Rise, uh, um, of people complaining that before when it was just, you know, single houses, bungalows, uh, um, with a wall separating you from your neighbor, everything was okay. But now they put up a multi-story building and your neighbor on the second, third floor can look straight into your bedroom window. These things raise issues. So you need people not only who are competent in um, the nuts and bolts or even the building blocks and mortar, but also people who understand the social and behavioral side, how people use spaces, how people interact with each other. And it's the humanities that provide that. So it's really a kind of partnership between all the disciplines um, that is needed. That open-mindedness is not only for educators at the primary and secondary level, but also for us. And we have been reinventing ourselves um, over the years. So now the faculty offers a wide range. You still get the traditional programs in history, in literatures in English, in uh, modern languages, but we are reinventing ourselves. So there are new and exciting programs. There's a program um, recently um, started in journalism and history especially in a country like Jamaica, there is a need for our journalists to be able to dig um, beneath the surface and sometimes help the police in unrooting um, um, corruption. So there's a synergy between the two. Um, cultural and creative industries, um, entertainment um, and cultural management too, lots of events, who want to go on all night. We need people to manage those processes. You get that in the humanities. I had mentioned already philosophy and ethics, uh, where sports is concerned, um, where um, people coming in, uh, say for example, um, Chinese and other nationals coming in, how do we treat with them as a nation? How do we treat with them as people? Uh, modern languages, programs in translation, because as the Chinese come and they come in larger numbers, we have to set up um, systems for dealing with them. Um, they'll need education. How do we educate people who do not speak languages that are common to the environment? We are going to need translators. We are going to need interpreters. Uh, by the way, the first language the Chinese learn is um, Jamaican Creole, not English, uh, which has implications too for how we treat the languages in our own space and the value that we add to those languages. So we have to be open-minded about um, what um, exists out there. We have... Um, Interesting programs in, um, such as film studies too, um, also animation, which is a big area. And that is an area where teachers can benefit because increasingly the classroom of today and more so the classroom of the future is not going to be a classroom where somebody stands before a set of students um, for however many hours delivering. In fact, students of today aren't used to that. So you'll need to get animation for them in order to bring across um, your concepts, um, the knowledge 
um, from the courses. The Caribbean School of Media and Communication um, offers such a program in animation. Um, Dr. White, um, who is the director, um, is here. And also Mrs. Um, Shevani Shevers White, um, who is the coordinator of that project. Um, in fact, right now, I'm having a conversation with um, Shevanis about my, um, my alma mater and us created an animation of the school history. So the old boys thought there was a need for current students to know the, 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 the school history. We have been going to them year after year, standing up uh, and giving them the whole long hundred and odd year. Many of them fall asleep. So the next move is to animate that for them, put it in a format that they are familiar with and that they can identify um, with. So we have been in, um, reinventing ourselves and we are inviting educators at all levels um, to do the same. Losing my notes here. Yes. So two. Educators must be readers of the signs of the time. So you have to have an understanding of where we are today, what is happening in our society. And the sign of the times is that although we are in the information age, knowing information is not really where it's at. It's knowing where to get your information. And so a lot of the things we used to teach um, in the classroom is um, students must know this. It's really information literacy that we need. This is something that is taught um, by the Department of Library and Information Studies. So how to access information. And I'm sure that many of us in this room, um, when we have things to do. Um, so um, just the other day, two days ago, I got um, what is called a security bulb because my apartment was broken into twice in two weeks. And to install the, um, the security bulb, I, I didn't even need a manual. The lady said to me, well, just go on YouTube, uh, type in the name of the bulb, and you'll get videos with the instructions. And so much of what we learn today is not in a formal classroom setting, but in settings like these. Um, so we have to be able to prepare students um, for learning itself and not so much for learning content, but the skills they come out with. And I think that is one of our strengths because we generally prepare um, students or graduates uh, who take up jobs in various areas. Um, the chief of defense, um, the head of the Jamaica Defense Force, um, is a graduate of the humanities has an undergraduate degree, a master's, and a PhD in linguistics. So when students say to me, what am I going to do with linguistics? So you can go and head the JDF. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very different sort of world that students exist in. And so we are saying, as you guide students, try not to narrow their vision, but help them to understand that there's a wide um, world out there. And finally, Educators must be predictors and shapers. We have always been shapers. But what I mean is not just in shaping students, but also taking on the role of shaping the future. So educators get a say in what Jamaica in 2030 and 2050 will be like by you saying to a student, have you considered that you could build the next time machine. So please, as we work with students, please open to them. Not only STEM, not only those other areas, but the humanities as viable areas and areas that make them ready for a variety of jobs. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. I had my college student with Diane. I didn't have mine with yours, but next time I'll have it. It was really, really, really inspiring, though, and really, 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 really good. So we really want to thank you for that wonderful um, 
synergy, bringing everything together for us. We appreciated that. I'm now going to ask Dr. Gentles, Carol Gentles, to come now and introduce our main speaker, Dr. Prophet Sachs. Okay, good morning. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce, to be, uh, to perform this um, task of um, introducing our speaker, Dr. Annette Maureen Crawford Sykes, um, who will speak to us on the topic Sites of Professional Training and Practice, the Blueprint. So I was instructed by Dr. McCallum that Dr. Crawford Sykes would be quite happy for us to simply announce her name and call her to the podium. But when I read her story, I found it so interesting and so impressive that I felt it's really important for you to hear who she is and what she has done in her life so you can appreciate how well qualified she is to speak with us this morning. I also tried to explain to her when I met her this morning that we in education, we, want, we always want to hear the story of the people that are coming to speak to us. So we're in the education sector now, we have to do what we normally do. So here goes, all right. So Dr. Crawford Sykes was born in Prospect District, Hanover, where she attended uh, Green Island Primary School and then Russie's High School up to fifth form. And she completed sixth form at St. Diego High School in Spanish Town and then went straight on to study at the University of the West Indies, graduating as a medical doctor. I've taken out the years because I figured I don't want to share that much with you. Right. So throughout school and university life, she was heavily involved in the performing arts, gaining various gold medals in JCDC dance competitions and being voted best actress of the Yui Talawa drama competition. So, so she's more than a doctor. Um, she completed her internship training at various hospitals throughout the country and decided that she would do a year in anesthesia, where in her opinion, um, you know, she could make a more competent and rounded medical practitioner. But that one year stretched to four years. And when she graduated in 1994 with her doctor of medicine degree in anesthetics, she realized this was her chosen field of specialization. She then went to Wales for a period of 20 months where she worked at the University Hospital of Wales and completed the examination requirements um, of the Royal College of Anaesthetists, becoming a fellow of that college. When she returned home, um, she came to work at UE and she was an appointed consultant anaesthetist at the UE hospital and lecturer. She teaches and trains undergraduate and postgraduate students in the Faculty of Medical Sciences contributing to the education of our future doctors and specialists. And in this regard, she helps to train nurses, students, and postgraduates in radiography and physiotherapy students. And she actually recently completed the certificate in university at teaching and learning. Um, she, in 2017, she was appointed as Deputy Dean of Student Success in the Faculty of Medical Sciences, a very intriguing um, position, <laughs> a post requiring her to care for all the students in the seven programs of the faculty. And she's also supervising the entrenchment of academic advising throughout the faculty, another very intriguing um, activity. Um, Dr. Crawford Sykes is well published with several papers in high-level journals. On the more personal side, she's been married for the last 32 years to Brian Sykes, who is the Chief Justice of Jamaica, and they're proud parents of five children, three biological and two fostered. She's a Christian and an active member of the Philip uh, Baptist Church in Spanish Town, Jamaica. She also does a lot of, you know, um, um, philanthropy um, through her church in Spanish Town. She organized a back to school health fair at the Green Island Baptist Church and has been doing it since 2013. She and her colleague doctors and medical team do approximately 50 school medicals for youngsters from all surrounding institutions, along with seeing an almost equal number of adult patients. And here's another very interesting fact. She's a trained Sister Locks consultant. She learns Spanish and she loves to watch sports. And her most, uh, you know, what she, she loves to do most is to spend a day on the beach with the blue skies, with the Caribbean Sea, you know, the waters warmly lapping on the, 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 on the beach. So now you know something about this lady. And I'm going to ask her now 
um, to come to the podium. So please help me to welcome her, Dr. Crawford Sykes. Thank you very much for that introduction. The Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Education who had to step out, Dr. Joseph Farkerson, whom I'm not sure I'm able to follow in his speech. Mrs. Marcia Rainford, the director, the director of the School of Education and my past teacher, I will add. Ms. Benjamin, the, Dr. Benjamin, the representative for the Ministry of Education, she also had to leave. Dr. Diane McCollum, to which you owe. I won't, I won't add an adjective to, to this interaction. <laughs> um, the coordinator for teacher education practicum and my, my most recent teacher, heads of departments of um, humanities in the, in the faculty, principals, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. To say I am intimidated by the lettered and illustrious company in which I find myself this morning would actually be to understate my emotional state. <laughs> you would understand that even my anatomy has been altered as right now my heart is to be found somewhere in my throat <laughs> rather than in my chest where it resides in the majority. <laughs> I have taken the risk to venture out of my comfort zone of blood and needles and syringes <laughs> as I found the topic assigned to me quite exciting. And I do thank you for inviting me. Um, I hope for us at the end of it to at least have a conversation about this. So medical training in the UWI takes five years for the undergraduate to graduate to being an intern. Internship is a year of supervised medical practice before the junior doctor achieves full registration as a doctor and is able to work independently. In the undergraduate program, the first two years are spent on the acquisition of the fundamentals of medical practice, the basic sciences. These involve anatomy, structure, physiology, function, molecular biology, how the body works at a molecular level, etc. This is the foundation on which the young doctor's skills will be based as long as the doctor chooses to practice clinical medicine. It doesn't matter whether the doctor interacts with patients directly or not. As the internist examines a patient on his couch, he is using the same anatomy that the radiologist is using to interpret images captured by x-rays, ultrasound, etc. There is no live patient contact in those first two years. But the students are introduced to aspects of medical practice working with each other. They learn how to take vital signs, do um, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, no, not on themselves, but on mannequins, um, techniques of communication with which they will be using, some of the humanities, according to Dr. Ferguson. <clears throat> They're taken through history taking involving all the systems of the body while learning how the, that system of the body works. And then they have a brief exposure to putting it together in taking a history and doing a basic clinical examination on real patients. Year three marks the switch to the clinical aspects of the program. In their junior clerkships, they rotate through internal medicine, surgery, pediatrics, and community health. This is primary health care out in the community. They should be able to take a history and do a reasonable physical examination of a patient. These are skills which are needed to successfully transition into year four. And thus the students are assessed and must be ruled satisfactory in order to proceed to their fourth year. In fourth year of the student's training, there is a complete transition to clinical instruction. That doesn't mean that they only see patients. It means that they are taught 
with patients and a lot in the clinical um, um, areas. In the fourth year, the students are rotated through the different specialties in, in medicine. Now. Here they are required to practice the same history taking and examination skills that they have learned in third year and to master it. The history taking and examination skills are honed with them noting, learning the nuances to different clinical specialties. They are gaining experience and increasing their competence continuously. Simultaneously, they are fully applying and extending the basic sciences that they have learned in the first two years now to real live patients. A fourth year student at the beginning of that fourth year is a very different student at the end of that fourth year because of this continuous practice. In fifth year, this is now a big year for the students. So apart from the extreme agitation that, of the awareness that they're about to do final MBBS and they will begin um, their internship in approximately a year, it is the year that the whole practice should all come together. They are now expected to be able to take a history, completely examine a patient, decide on a likely list of differential diagnoses, order investigations, and then decide on a likely diagnosis from that list. They are expected to begin to treat appropriately urgent and emergency conditions in patients until a doctor who is more senior is available. Please know though that they remain fully supervised and all management decisions and actions are checked and double checked. In law, the final responsibility really is not theirs. They're still students. So just a recap, in all of fourth and fifth year, the medical students are under full supervision from the seniors on the team on which they're working they see, stu they see patients on their own, but these patients have to be presented to a senior and there is continual feedback on their techniques and on their critical and um, clinical analysis. They have prescribed tasks that must be observed and done and these are recorded usually on a procedure and attendance sheet. The constant aim is to hone the skills of the developing young professional with a view to making him better. The feedback is sometimes not done in the most helpful manner, but as you know, that is a constant work in progress. Where are the students trained clinically with live patients? In our situation, they're trained in hospitals, firstly. So that includes UHWI, KPH, Victoria Jubilee, Bustamante Hospital for Children, Spanish Town Hospital, um, Maypen Hospital, Mandeville Regional Hospital, Savlama, Cornwall Regional, St. Anne's Bay. So they're all over the place. They do different specialties in these sites. And the encouragement is that the students go to different sites throughout their fourth and fifth year, though they do have a choice in this matter. They are also trained, not just in hospitals, but in primary health care clinics. And those are both in the rural areas and in the urban areas. Thus, when the medical students come to their final assessment, they have been exposed to many and varied clinical conditions in many and varied settings with many and varied personnel. Internship means that the student has been awarded his MBBS degree and has been granted partial registration to practice as a doctor for a year in the first instant. The intern doctor has more autonomy than, say, a senior student, but is the most junior doctor on his team. His work is subject to constant scrutiny in the form of discussions with more senior doctors, ward rooms, and sometimes queries from other members of the healthcare team, such as nurses and or physiotherapists, for example. The intern has to successfully complete at least his four major rotations in internal medicine, surgery, obstetrics and gynecology, and pediatrics to gain full registration as a doctor. 
the most senior doctor, the consultant, signs off on the assessment. And if the intern is deemed unsatisfactory in any rotation, he can be asked to repeat that rotation. The sites of practice for internship are inspected and approved before the interns are posted there. The sites have to meet specific requirements. So what does the training of medical doctors have to do with the training of teachers, i.e. why is a doctor talking to a whole set of educators? <laughs> Your teacher training is shorter, it's last, it lasts three years, and you are training a teacher in a particular subject area, which means that the teacher is acquiring content knowledge as well as pedagogical skills. So in that first year, from an education point of view now, the student teacher is learning all the various theories of learning, behaviorism, cognitivism, constructivism, connectivism, but then I'm speaking to educators, right? I'm completely out of my depth. So let me leave that well alone. They are then required to do at least three observations of teaching in action and to write about this in relation to the theories of learning to which they have already been exposed and what they learn about the observation themselves. The question I have here is, how is the site of observation chosen? For medical training, as I said before, the sites are examined and approved. And who is chosen for the students to observe when they go, when they go to the school? Is there a way to determine the practitioner with the best pedagogical content knowledge? And are those the ones to whom the students are sent for observation? In medical training, there has to be a consultant responsible for the area to which the student is assigned at a particular site. On the other hand, <clears throat> my other question is, are different practitioners chosen so that the student teacher can compare, contrast, and critique the practitioners from the point of view um, of their application of learning theories so that the students begin to see the theories in live action and different ways of implementing them. In, in teacher training, year, year two, after their classroom learning in both their specific content area as well as aspects of pedagogical training, the student teachers return to the schools in pairs for their teaching practicum. <clears throat> Here, the student teachers are co-planning and co-teaching with the classroom teachers for three weeks, and then they're doing the same with their fellow student teacher under the watchful eye of the classroom teacher. Similar questions come to me. Is there a method to choose the schools to which the student teachers are, are sent? <clears throat> and is there a method to choose the supervisory teachers to ensure that the ones with the best pedagogical content knowledge are the ones that are being selected to train these student teachers? Or are the students being rotated? with numerous specialist teachers to have a wide exposure to different methods of displaying pedagogical content knowledge in order to develop their own style based on sound learning theories and teaching examples. I am not saying here, please, that in the MBBS we have the best teachers, practitioners, supervisors at, at every site. But every site to which students and interns are sent is inspected to ensure that there are enough tra staff trained to a particular level to ensure supervision of the student or intern. Are the sites to which the, the student teachers go inspected to ensure that the specific objectives for which the students are sent are achieved? Is there an adequate number of staff trained to the particular level to ensure appropriate supervision of the student teachers. In your final year, in their 10-week practicum, they should have it all together. It should, it should be the equivalent of our fifth year in, in medicine. Um, but all my questions above still apply. To which sites do they go? How are they monitored? Are they being mentored and guided? 
a practice that I learned in education, more so than in medicine, is a practice of intentional reflection on one's teaching. In medicine, we do peer review, and that's usually done contemporaneously on ward rounds with discussions and from consultation with colleagues and stuff. I know great effort is placed on the teacher becoming a reflective practitioner, being intentional about planning the lesson, reflecting in action as the lesson is proceeding, reflecting on action as the lesson is completed, and to close the loop by noting what needs to change and then changing it. I sound like I learned something in the certificate of university teaching and learning, didn't I? I do think it's an excellent practice, which yields a better practitioner. But if the student um, teachers are like I am, they're much brighter, of course. It needs to be modeled to the student teachers as well as being taught to them. Are the supervisory teachers to whom these, stu these student teachers are being sent reflective practitioners? In other words, what are the skills that should be evident in the supervisory teacher to bring out the best training in the student teachers? And who is documenting those? As I said for medical training, the students, stroke interns, have tasks assigned that have to be completed and signed off. And the consultant has to give a detailed review of the intern. Finland is a country whose educational system has ranked in the upper levels of the program for international students assessment, whether you agree with it or not, <clears throat> in the, the result consistently. But there are many aspects of the Finnish education system that may be contributing to their success. But an area I would like to emphasize is their attention to the training of their teachers. Their program is a five-year program, three years at the bachelor's level and two years at the master's level. There are teacher training schools attached to the various universities. These are specifically to assist in the practical aspects of teaching. In Finland, appro approximately 15 to 20% of all their teacher training is spent in practice. I'm not sure if that was the thought behind the micro and short with practicing schools um, that we actually have. These sites of practice are areas of mentorship where two student teachers are assigned to a supervising teacher. The student teachers observe the supervisory teacher teaching. They discuss and modify their lesson plans with her. They teach as she observes and takes notes. And then there is debriefing, reflection on the whole process. Her role is to help the student teachers to conceptualize what is happening in the classes and to combine theory and practice. The university is sure i.e. the Finnish university sure that the site of practice is up to the standard that the university wishes. In Singapore, another country that consistently ranks highly in the PISA result, there is a heavy emphasis on the level of professional development even when the teacher starts his teaching career. In medical terms, I would say, when he becomes an intern. Beginning teachers, and that's the phrase they use, get intensive mentoring. A beginning teacher teaches only two thirds the hours of senior teachers. This is to allow them to work with their mentors, looking at their pedagogy, ensuring that they have enough content knowledge and participating in professional learning and mentoring um, every two weeks. In the two countries I mentioned, the teacher is a complete professional. The curriculum is a guide as to what the student needs to achieve, but the decision about the method of attainment of the aims and objectives is entirely up to the teacher. Therefore, there is an element of trust of the system to the teacher that she will achieve the requisite objectives and of the teacher to the system to ensure fidelity in the realization of the aims and objectives for the student. The great similarity, therefore, 
between medical training and teacher training is that you cannot become either professional by reading alone. You have to do it. I am therefore suggesting that apprenticeship training is the way to go with teacher training, as it is with medical training. The skills that are essential for a student teacher to acquire in order to embark on their teaching career with reasonable skill should be clarified and some documentation devised to record the achievement of these skills. I am suggesting that discussion ensue as to the length of time that would be appropriate to acquire the defined reasonable level of, sk of skill. I am not here suggesting that the training be lengthened necessarily. I am suggesting that you at least discuss what's the time period, what time period it should be like. I am suggesting that sites of professional training and practice be identified where the student teacher is certain to acquire the requisite pedagogical content skills. I am suggesting that the properties of these sites of professional training and practice be documented. You are better than I would ever be to suggest what data points to use. Number of students, student to teacher ratio, qualifi qualification of the supervisory teacher, years of their practice, I don't know. You, you will have to decide on that. And I am suggesting that the first year graduate from teacher training is to be considered as an intern, to be guided by intentional mentoring and professional development by senior colleagues to increase their confidence as a professional and to continue their growth in the area of pedagogical content knowledge. I thank you for your attention. We want to thank Dr. Crawford Sykes. She has certainly given us a number of challenges, certainly raised some interesting and important questions for us to consider. And I'm sure that as we have our discussion session shortly, some of these issues will be also addressed. Thank you, Annette, for sharing so candidly and so comprehensively with us this morning. I'm now going to invite um, Dr. Aisha Spencer, I wasn't sure how to, to say who she is, but she's just Aisha Spencer this morning to introduce our, our final facilitator for the morning. Thank you very much, Director. As you noticed a while ago, she just had my talk. My talk was given a while ago. All right, she just whispered something in my ear to indicate to indicate that, um, yes, I have to, to be on the brief side of life. Um, right, so good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, boy, you sound like you just had breakfast of truth and ready to go back to bed. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today, it is an honor to introduce to you a powerful and influential woman who has for many years navigated several kinds of journeys as a woman, as a mother, as a wife, and as educator. Very much like the biblical Esther, Mrs. Esther Tyson has occupied a cultural, spiritual, and historical space through her presence and work in Jamaica. A Jamaican educator for over 37 years, Mrs. Tyson is known as an indomitable force with a kind and humble spirit. She has functioned in the post of principal for two high schools. We know one, right? Arden <laughs> and Tarrant High and as vice principal for St. Andrew High School in Kingston, Jamaica. She's most popularly known for the major turnaround she brought about in the school climate and culture of Arden High School between 2000 and 2011. Her exposure and expertise in the area of education causes her to be a heavily sought after educator and many eagerly request her input because of her candid advice and strategic solutions with respect to the effective management of schools, the skills needed for purposeful parenting, and the empowerment of student populations. 
Her voice has been heard across the different media platforms, radio, television, newspapers, and she can also be found on social media. Between 2007 and 2016, Mrs. Tyson's thoughts on social and educational issues were read by local and diasporic audiences through a monthly newspaper column she wrote for the Jamaica Gleaner. In 2018, she pulled together these views, represented it, the, all the views represented through this column and published her thought-provoking book, A Summiseat, A Summiseat. Unafraid of criticism or harsh commentary about her views, through this book, Esther Tyson addresses controversial topics and connects her discussions of them with an understanding of their impact on the Jamaican population. Her outspokenness is always intricately tied to her passion and willingness to uphold integrity, <laughs> social justice, and morality. She is indeed, as Maya Angelou has penned, a phenomenal woman. Join me this morning in welcoming the inspiring, stimulating, knowledgeable Mrs. Esther. Wow, that's so nice. <laughs> that's the most powerful intro I've ever had. Thank you, Aisha. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. It's still morning. It is such a pleasure and a delight for me to be here. And as they say, I am a past student of the School of Education. I did my DPED there, I did my master's there, and some people want me to do doctorate. I say, if I do a doctorate, it's not going to go back to school of education. I need another experience. But I'm not doing a doctorate. I'm going to be writing more. So, this morning, I want us just to reflect on this, the two matters that we are looking at, schooling and the future preparation for life, work, and learning over the lifespan, and particularly the concern that we have in terms of the humanities not being a focus in the current thrust by the Ministry of Education on STEM. And trust me, I believe that as a nation we do need to have the thrust on STEM, but I believe that the Ministry of Education should have had from the very beginning a thrust on STEAM. And this has been attached at the end, which is unfortunate, and you know how our people are. It's going to take some time for them to catch on, that that A is important, it's very important. So we're living in a world where the internet of things, IOT is the buzzword. Manufacturing, production, medicine, science is being driven by technology and internet connections. No longer do companies have to send representatives hundreds of miles to have face-to-face -face meetings. They now use video conference calls. News is broadcasted in real time. Artificial intelligence, AI, is affecting how business is done. So many rapid changes have taken place in this fourth industrial revolution. In the midst of this STEM push, however, we must include the humanities and the arts. STEM must be STEAM. Robots and AI do not have the capacity for passion and introspection and reflection of the human soul. Inspiration of dance, poetry, painting, music, romance cannot come from robots. It is the A in STEAM that makes emotion come alive in our human breast. To not prepare our students in the humanities and the arts means that we will develop a cold, clinical world with little heart. What a world that would be. A world without inspiration. And I really was delighted with Dr. Farkinson by Dr. Farkinson's presentation that was just so inspirational. Think about what is remembered throughout the ages. The words of Shakespeare, Milton, Dante, Chinua Achebe, Derek Walcott, the art of Michael, Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, Pablo Picasso, the music of Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, Handel. Who will not be awed by Handel's Messiah? 
these works span centuries. Whereas the intervention of the steam engine that produced the first industrial revolution has been superseded by subsequent inventions. These works, however, have gained immortality. The arts, the humanities, produce those. On a national level, think about Titchfield High School in the 1950s, produce luminaries in the arts such as Edward Ball and Noel Dexter. Think of Louise Bennett and Bob Marley. These people use the arts to tell our story, to reflect our passion and our soul. We therefore cannot sideline the arts in the thrust to engage our children in STEM. Indeed, the Ministry of Education has a responsibility to ensure that the soul of our people is represented in future generation through the humanities and the art forms. Jamaica is known worldwide because of our music. We have the song of the 20th century that is sung all over, One Love. How then can we not see the importance of our training our young in these art forms? The arts combined with STEM will strengthen the fabric of our society. It is through the arts that as a people, we have come to better understand our identity. It is Miss Lou who brought the Jamaican Creole to the fore in an age when we were shamed for speaking the dialect. Consider the work of Barbara Gloudon in the National Pantomime that tells the story of our society in a creative form. Rex Netterford, who established the National Dance Theatre Company that reflected the creativity and professionalism of our Jamaican dancers in creative dance and became known internationally. Our poets and novelists, dancers and musicians are part of our wealth that we need to hone and develop. Think about music. We can develop sound studios in our schools where we teach our students to be sound engineers and all the technical aspects of producing music. In those studios, many students will find their voice, develop their talent, and possibly be the next coffee who at age 19 has won the Reggae Grammy Award, the first female to do so from Arden, just a plug there. <laughs> Think about story writing. Let's encourage our students to write their stories, give voice to their pain, encourage them to publish their stories, their poetry. Out of them will arise the next generation that will reflect our nation's soul. And as uh, Dr. Farkerson spoke to the whole matter of Marcus Garvey and his philosophy, in the 20th century, we have a necessity to have and understand cultural integration. And we hear a lot of these buzzwords about integration. We need to have the content to integrate, yes? So just having STEM alone will not produce content. It is the humanities and the arts that produce the content. What about learning our history? We are so thankful that, for example, Professor Vereen Shepherd has been revealing the truth of our history so that we no longer have only the representation of those who enslaved our forefathers to relate our history as seen only through their biases and their lens. I was really happy to hear about this course in journalism and history that has been introduced. And certainly the humanities, the faculty will have to be more innovative and continue to be innovative in sparking the interest of students coming from the high school and in also uh, having the principals realize just how important it is to push the humanities. So that's a brief comment. Now to speak about another aspect of schooling, that of the training and supervision of practice teachers. As a former principal, 
I am aware that in many of our schools, when we agree to have practice teachers in our classrooms, many teachers see it as an opportunity to get a break from being in the classroom. Am I speaking the truth or am I speaking the truth? Okay. They have not accepted their role as the cooperating teacher. In my days, it was supervising, but Dr. McCallum tell me it's a new term now, cooperating teacher. All right. Later on, after the, the practice teachers have left, then the teachers complain that the practice teachers did not follow the unit plan or the teachers were unable to manage the class as reported, because they were not in there, as reported by some other teacher or students. They are seeing the practice teachers as a nuisance, since it means that they will need to go and present, be present in the class after they get the complaints and it reaches the principal, you know. They have to go and sit in the class. So they find that to be very annoying. This whole aspect of our teachers becoming reflective practitioners. There's a need to change the culture in education in Jamaica. I have served as an inspector and supervisor and trainer and all sorts of things. So I've been around schools in Jamaica and let me tell you, even the reports from the NEI and my observation shows that that is the weakest area of practice with our teachers. They're not reflective. They will tell you, but miss, it's too much work. So you will take up a lesson plan and you look and it's nice and then you come to reflection one, reflection two. The children did this, the children did that. What did you do? Have you thought about how you could improve or is this, has this worked so that you can replicate it and share it with others? No. And so it is something that has to be, become integral in our psyche as teachers in this country, reflection. And that reflection is part of what we need for practice teachers to develop, not only the practice teachers, but also the classroom teachers, the senior teachers, at all levels, that's a weakness in our system. So, we need to address these issues. First, I know you realize more than ever, our novice teachers are coming from a society that has few role models to show them how to be professionals who have high moral standards who are empathetic to the issues of the children, who are resilient, who see learning as an endeavor to be excited, to be engaged in, who see themselves as ongoing learners, who take pride in their work and see education as a hope for many in this nation. Therefore, supervising cooperating, cooperating teachers are not only responsible to give the novice teachers the timetable and show them the classrooms. They're also to help to guide their pedagogy and to help them and to shape them as professional teachers. And as Dr. Sykes says, being a professional, you cannot just read it. You have to, what you said? Do it. I'm a principal, and once a principal, always a principal. You have to do it. They are your interns. They are your interns, even as in the medical profession, those interns, I'm sorry for them, sometimes some hours are here, they have to keep, but they are your interns. The teacher must consequently see them in action to be able to guide them in their attitudes and practice. And a part of the change that, that this will uh, uh, bring is that I want to see our schools become professional learning communities yeah. where teachers, I, I have to put a plug for this. You know that one of the biggest problems in the classroom is bad mind in this country. Mm -hmm. So while I was working with Jamaica National, we had a project that we had in region, region two, where we give the teachers we gave the schools video cameras, and we had this brilliant idea that you can videotape a class and you sit down and watch it together and review it. Not a soul use it. 
You know why? Fear. Everyone is afraid to see someone watch them teaching. Yes, it is a big problem. And so it is the same thing that the teachers themselves, one, they can't bother, and two, they, there's a sort of empathy with the, the, the practice teacher not to make them feel afraid. We have to change all of that if we are to improve the quality and standard of teaching in this country. So in summary, we have a responsibility to help to improve the cadre of teachers that are being prepared to teach our nation's children. Using a hands-off approach will not accomplish this. It would be good that apart from acknowledge the acknowledgement that comes from the School of Education, that schools themselves celebrate the best cooperating teachers by presenting them to the school and acknowledging the input that they have had in training practice teachers. In addition, a copy of the certificate that they receive from the School of Education should be put on their file. You see, these days, persons want to know what they will get in return for what they do. And teachers see it as additional work. You have to motivate them. Sadly, altruism, when faced with poor working conditions, substandard pay and living conditions, is not viewed as a priority. Again, we want to improve our educational system, the standard of teaching in our school rooms. And, as we have heard, and I reiterate, we cannot have teachers become professionals by reading alone. They have to do it. So that's a little intro. And now for the big work, the round table discussions. And we're going to be having 10 tables. I think you're all numbered. And there are different topics of discussion for each table. Now, as I call the names of the facilitator, could you come and collect your question, your topic of discussion? Okay, table one. We have the facilitator for table one, Dr. Rosemary Heath, uh, Dr. Carol Gentles. Could any of these ladies for table one Please come and collect. So this is, let me see, tables. Um, Dr. McCallum, is this enough for tables one and two or for both tables one and two? So I need to call table two, Dr. Ingrid McLaren. So can divide that with Ingrid. Thank you. Then table three, Dr. Chantal Moore, Dr. Nina Bruni. This is another of my past students, and I'm very proud of them. <laughs> okay. Okay. Table four, Dr. Sonia Stanley Naya and Dr. Paula Ferrara. Not here. So who is going to do um, table four? And table six also has the same topic. So table six, we have Dr. Rachel Mosley, Miss Lisa Brown. Any of those ladies could come and collect this, so this would be divided between tables four and six. All right. Thank you. Okay, so let me go again. Tables five uh, and table nine, you will have the same topic. And we have uh, Dr. Enrique Coneve, am I pronouncing that properly? And Dr. Saron Stewart. And you will be with also table nine, we'll be having the same topic. And those persons will be Miss Camille Berry and Mr. Miguel Issam. 
Yes, so could you divide it also with table nine? All right. Okay, thank you. All right. Then we have table seven and eight. Table seven, Dr. Livingston White, Dr. Yewande Lewis Fulcom, and table eight uh, will be Mrs. Dulcie Townsend. Okay. So, so divide that. Mm -hmm. And lastly, table 10. Table 10, principals invited from Clarendon and St. Catherine. Uh, let me see. That's table 10. Where is table 10? May I see where is table 10? Okay. Oh, but is it Mr. Hall, you're not from St. Catherine or Clarendon? Okay. Okay, so there are three of you. So could one of you just come and take this because... So Dr. McCallum, we need a, a facilitator for table 10. All right. Oh, Mr. Hall, can, Major Hall can be the facilitator. Now, uh, how much time do they have now? Twenty minutes. You have twenty minutes, according to my watch. It is eleven twenty-five. So therefore, at quarter to twelve, you will get a signal to wrap up. Now remember, you're going to report back to the foot, Dr. McCallum. Am I correct? We're going to have feedback from each table. So you need to have someone. It's a scribe, a rapper to are taking notes. So you can present to the full group your findings. So now it's time for feedback. So each table you have, not each table, each topic, can the topics, the table with the topics come together. So we have discussion topic A, the impact of focusing on STEM and not STEAM. Sub question, did the Ministry of Education send the wrong message? By initially promoting STEM and not STEAM, how can the situation be recovered? Tables one and two. Could you come and give us your feedback on that question? Good morning, colleagues. So at table one, we had differing views. One person felt that STEM is a specific focus to promote particular careers to meet the shortage of educators in certain areas. Therefore, the ministry did not make a mistake. However, most persons um, thought otherwise. One thought was, well, one question that was asked is, is it that the thinking is that we are already doing well in the arts, and so we have to focus on STEM? But you see, one other person who works in a technical school felt that although there is great appreciation for the focus on STEM, we need to understand that the arts will help STEM students to express whatever they have learned um, in STEM 
in terms of how they interact afterwards with their environment and the persons around them. We take for granted our supremacy. People see the arts as a hobby, which is sad. And the example of coffee was given. It is said that coffee is very good without any formal training, and so people don't really feel that you need to focus on the arts in terms of offering training. The arts are seen as a hustle to many people. We think of arts as just performing arts too, and that is not so. The building of houses can be seen as, as, as belonging to the arts because an architect um, who designs a house to begin with will have to know a bit of history to know how to tap into a certain era in order to present a house, a building in a particular way to get a particular effect, okay? And um, so in terms of expressing designs, Jamaica's position in the world holds us to standards that are humanistic. Brazil went ahead with STEM and crashed because their culture is their selling point. So they made a big error right there. We rely on tourism as a product. Let's not forget that. Tourists come to our shores for the entertainment and cultural enterprise. We need to strengthen the capacity of the performing artists. We would be well served with a high school in the arts as well. They have done well in our government, that is, has done well in, um, in articulating their desire for STEM. However, this articulation is not translated into the future. Our engineers have to migrate to find employment. They are not even internationally competitive since India, China, Japan have the edge already. And so right now, Someone at the table spoke of an individual who is a Jamaican civil engineer and is working at Home Depot in the United States. What then is the purpose of education? It is to produce a well-rounded well individual who has been exposed to a balanced education. STEAM will provide that. This is what we were expecting to do all along anyhow, STEAM. So what is really the argument? The absence of the arts creates coarse, unfeeling individuals. <laughs> okay. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. We, um, our approach um, began similar to Dr. Heath's um, team's approach, where we were looking, we started looking at the um, danger of focusing just on one or the other, and so on and so forth. But we quickly moved to a more to a wider perspective. First of all, we were, we are aware that our teaching methods have to change. If we are teaching literature, we have to look at our delivery. The book thing don't work too good with these students anymore. We have to think of ways to engage them send them to look at um, something related on YouTube, etc. Even here at the university, as I was saying, if light goes and we don't have a PowerPoint, we can just leave the lecture. They are not going to sit down with us reading or lecture to them. They have to have this type of interchange, which is technology and which is a kind of balance as well. We move on to the whole issue of teaching in Jamaica at this point that the teaching is not an attractive prof profession. What can we do to make it more attractive? Could, is it that um, when young teachers happen to come, you know, in high schools, we encourage a mentorship type of program that will make them see a future in teaching and, you know, encourage them to stay for the long haul? That was one of our considerations. On the other hand, the conditions relating to salary, etc., are also not attractive. Not only the conditions in the school, but the general um, remuneration, not attractive. So this would be something internal to the school, they, 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 they attempting to teach, to, to get teachers
committed, more committed teachers, um, capable committed teachers, as well as to make them, sorry, via mentorship program, as well as to make them want to stay by, um, you know, using, helping them to um, see a way forward via better remuneration. That was a major thing, and we were, the, so the conditions of service need to be more attractive, because as was pointed out in our team, both, we, we are short of both teachers in the sciences and in the arts. So we need to try and top up on those areas. And I don't think that, um, if, if, if it is balanced, if we have teachers for both areas, then I think it will become pretty obvious that we both need, we need both STEM and we need STEAM. I think we'll all agree. I don't think that we, we need to push it at the one or the other. We need a balance. So that was our position. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, Dr. McCallum, we have a rapporteur taking the notes from the, what they are saying because I don't know that they're always readable. Okay, want to make sure that's been captured. Okay, wonderful. Uh, now we're going to move to table five because there is a need for tables five and nine, your dear topic, we're going to move to table five. What strategies can be used to have the humanities and the arts work with STEM to produce the most rounded and rich education experience for our teachers? So let's welcome table five. And where's table nine? Did you just, so you, you have the same topic, don't you? So could you come the person who is presenting also? And please, not more than three minutes. Um, thank you. Apologies, uh, but I have a class in one minute, so I'm going to take like uh, probably two minutes of your time, <laughs> if, uh, if uh, probably less than that, so I can rush to my class. Uh, so for us, in our case, uh, we put across the idea of uh, how to transcend the, um, the disciplines, right, the, the subjects in the high schools, how we can encourage the students to do that. Like, uh, rather than teach them to, in, in terms of thinking about compartmentalized knowledge, how they, we can increase the collaboration. Um, and, well, basically, the ideas that were uh, shared uh, by, uh, by our table is that we need, uh, there are some, some challenges. I mean, the, uh, the schools already are doing some of this through uh, what they call integration, right? But it was, it was conveyed that some of the challenges have to do with the system and some of the challenges have to do with the individuals. The system is, is the great pressure to teach to the test sometimes. Like, uh, we all know how it is, and, and, and there's a great pressure on the schools, on the principals, on the, on, on the teachers, and, and from, uh, to, to teach to the test so the students can do well in the test. So that's one of the, of the challenges. And we couldn't come with a definitive idea as to how we can transcend the teaching to the test, but obviously something that we need to give uh, uh, more thought to it in order to allow the greater integration of the, of the different subjects in the schools. In addition to that, uh, we focus on the challenges from the individuals. The, the teachers sometimes don't feel really comfortable in, in doing these sort of, of things. And what we discussed, we suggested that we need greater communication um, uh, and exchanges uh, among teachers from the different from the different departments. Sometimes the, the, the teachers from one department is almost like uh, silos, if you if you like. If we are going to work uh, along the integration of different disciplines or subjects, we need greater communication. And also that requires that time is allotted for this. That it's encouraged from from the uh, the school's principals, like uh, to uh, uh, for the teachers to have time to do these things. Uh, the training institutions, the training institutions play a major role. They also have to teach their future t uh, teachers to develop these kind of uh, uh, cross disciplinary uh, uh, assignments, projects, and and so on and so on. And finally, uh, I think um, that also exchanges across the different levels of education. That's another thing which, like, we can we can see how they uh, uh, we can integrate better. Like sometimes they. Uh, uh, Rather than just going to different schools, sometimes like we need to go to to know what is happening in the different levels of our education, and perhaps this can also facilitate. I think this is it. Um, let me just double check. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.
you will need to bear with me a bit. I'm just getting my voice back. Oh dear. Yeah, so all protocols observed, and I beg to say all jokes observed. <laughs> so I'm not giving any jokes today. <laughs> new phrase, new phrase, all jokes observed. All right. Essentially, we're going to piggyback on what was said, but we'll add some new things possibly. So one, in terms of we believe that we need to infuse humanities into STEM areas. And there are a couple of ways that can be done. Um, going back to my experience at school, I was sharing how the physics teacher used to make us learn the biographies, you know, and research background to scientists. But these days, we are so preoccupied with completing syllabus so that students can get the best grades and that schools will look good. We just teach Newton's laws and we don't spend time saying, who was Newton? People don't realize that, you know, he was a little boy at some stage. He might have struggled with science, you know, like Albert Einstein, and you share the struggles that they had so that students can identify with these great scientists as being people too, than just teaching simply science as content and not trying to make these people real by placing them in a particular context, the age that they lived in, right? So the whole biography is needed. Um, there's need for teacher collaboration and planning. Very often we have our departments and we simply plan as departments. So all the scientists meet and they plan, the arts people meet and they plan. We hardly think of having cross department sessions and planning, right? And so that will allow us to integrate. So you can have the history teacher, you know, and the drama teacher give you ideas. And so in science we can do role, role play. Very often we complain that resources are limited and we have all this creative energy. The kids are dying to do something and we say, you sit still, do not move. The class is one hour long and the kids are dying to be dramatic and to do something. But because they're doing science, we put them into a box. It's supposed to be boring, snoring, as my daughter would say, you know, boring, snoring, and no fun in science. You know? It is just about the content and getting it done. So I think role play, if we collaborate with each other from different um, areas, that certainly will help. Um, then we talked about phenomenon-based learning, something that's been done, for example, in Finland. So you're not so much just teaching the science content, you are teaching a problem, so you're looking at, say, World War III, and you're going to integrate, well, sorry, World War III came up because it was planted in my head earlier, my colleague, my colleague planted. We can fix this. One, two, one, two. It is a short thing. Is there a short somewhere? Yes. Anyway, my colleague planted World War Three in my head, so it's stuck. Let's hope she's not being prophetic. So you're teaching World War Two or World War One. You can talk about, you know, um, the science involved in the tools being used, right? You can talk about the stories and the arts. So the idea is that you don't want to just teach um, physics, but you want to teach um, concepts. Mm -hmm. And you are integrating, you are drawing from as many areas as you need to effectively teach that concept. And therefore, we are working as a school in terms of greater synergy. So that you have department meetings, great. But also once in a while, there are whole school staff meetings. And you share what you're doing and say, hey, how can I use that history knowledge in my class? That business idea. Because very often scientists don't see themselves as business people. They just see themselves as, you know, creators of, of knowledge, but we need to integrate and collaborate as best as we can and infuse everything into teaching. Blessing. Thank you very much. And that is the focus of the Ministry of Education with the National Standards Curriculum, that to do cross uh, integration, curriculum integration, which means schools have to rethink how you plan in terms of common planning, in terms of timetabling. So those are some of the areas that we have to look at when we are considering infusing the subjects, the, the humanities, the arts in the STEM. Good. So thank you very much. Tables five and nine. Discussion topic B. How can school leaders assist in giving value <clears throat> to the cooperation between the SOE and schools in developing the skills of student teachers? And this is table three. Where is table three? Table three, please come. Good afternoon, colleagues. 
Our table had a vibrant discussion around the topic and we were focusing on that simple word, how, because we think that it needs to be operationalized because we need to see results coming out of the school leaders, um, collaborating with the School of Education to ensure that the skills that are required in our students, in um, our student teachers actually, you know, get going, operationalized. The skills are operationalized. So we, from the discussion, we agreed that communication between the School of Education and school leaders is critical. Communication in terms of the time span within which schools are informed that our students from the School of Education are going to be at those schools. So it can't be the night before, the day before. It has to be a longer duration, simply because of the second point that the students, they come with content knowledge, and that is a given. But the students need to know the other kinds of competences that the school that they're going to will need to develop within them. So the school leaders are concerned about things like, um, you know, being aware of the, the psychosocial needs, being aware of the, um, the gender issues, being aware of, um, you know, what is happening in terms of um, nutrition, um, punk attendance, all of those kinds of things. The culture needs to be communicated to the beginning teachers who are coming. I'm gonna use beginning teachers to refer to the students who are coming from the School of Education, so as not to confuse with students at the, the schools, the corporate in schools. So that is important. The school leaders need to know what exactly are the deficiencies of the beginning teachers so that they can begin to create that space to, to educate them and inculcate them within that kind of um, environment. Secondly, um, another how is the integration of the student uh, or the beginning teacher within the school. Many of the student teachers or beginning teachers, they come with a mentality that I am a student, that it's more a passive position and they need to change that mentality and come with a mentality of, I am now a beginning teacher, I'm a practitioner. I come with skills and, and knowledge and awareness that I need to, 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 to apply. So if we work at that mentality, we can get students performing closer to the expectations or on point with the expectations. How do we change our beginning teacher's mentality? We can do so by before, we have an, an instrument similar to a JD, a job description, where we get the students to see what it is that the school leaders would want them to, to exhibit and to acquire and to practice. The third thing has to do with feedback and a, a deeper rapport between the school leaders and the, the corporate in school um, and the School of Education. So in terms of a rapport, Many times, the School of Education will have a supervisor who comes into the corporate in school, and the supervisor will just look at what is happening within that classroom space with the beginning teacher. But the school leaders would want to open up that conversation and observation so that when the supervisor has done his or her three visits and leaves, the school leader wants to have a voice in how the student, how the beginning teacher is graded. Right, so we need to have that conversation with the school leader to see, because many of the school leaders are actually in tune. Some of them actually meet with the, the students when they come and all of those things. So they want to have a voice in the feedback process, a kind of stand to say, we are helping to contribute our, our understanding of how you have graded that student. And finally, it has to do with opening up the seminars at the School of Education to benefit from the expertise of the school leaders. We have a community that we have not tapped into. We are aware that there are a community from one end where we need to place our students in those schools. So we say, yes, we have a community, we have a relationship going, but we don't see it on the other side that we need to invite that community of school leaders into the classroom spaces, into the seminars, for them to share the real life practical experiences or the cultures that our beginning teachers are going to go into. So we need to have them built in a space for them in our seminars. And um, so just to wrap up is that overall, better student product, the beginning teacher, better beginning teachers, 
that comes from one, more effective communication, two, involvement of the school leaders in the SOE student seminars for training students, three, making apparent and obvious the expectations of school culture, um, school leaders' um, expectations, HODs, classroom teachers, so on, making those expectations apparent early enough so that the mentees, the, um, the beginning teachers, can know what to do. Have these expectations recorded within instruments that the beginning teacher can sign on to at the start, and then also have that instrument to allow for reporting, a reporting mechanism from the school leaders to the School of Education. And those are the ways in which we can begin to see the valuing of the cooperation between the School of Education and the developing skills of our students. Thanks. Okay. Wonderful. Okay, we're moving on. And please remember, keep it very concise. Now, tables four and six, uh, discussion topic C. The humanities is all but dead this time around. How can the humanities reestablish or establish its relevance and stand up to big money and the support given to STEM and other emerging fields? Please come, tables. Have you combined your reports? Where's table? What table are you coming from? Where's six? Oh, six. Oh, well, okay, so it's just table four. Good. All right. So you have three minutes. Okay. That's a problem. Good afternoon, colleagues. All right, um, just dealing with the first aspect of the question, the humanities is all but dead this time around. Our table gave an emphatic no. no. The humanities is not barely living or all but dead. And our reasons for saying this, we have firstly, the four C's that are being promoted as critical yes. for students in the 21st century. We have collaboration, creativity, mm -hmm. communication, and critical thinking. I don't hear much of STEM mm -hmm. in, 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 in those things. Those are, they, they are related, but they are the, they are the, the, the staples mm -hmm. of the humanities. So if our students need these four critical skills to function in the 21st century, there's no way that the humanities can be all but dead. Um, the other thing is that we have to look at the effective learning or the input of effective learning in our students learning anything. Mm -hmm. If our students aren't motivated, if we don't know how to motivate them, then the sciences will not be as important to them if you can't tell them the why and the how and connect it to something that is within them. Mm -hmm. So we know that effective learning is, is important and that also comes from the humanities. So that's, if we want our students to learn all the other things that we consider to be important, and they are, but arts is, are necessary as well. All right, we also focused on relationships and the, the importance of, of the arts in building and maintaining relationships. So all these lovely projects that the scientists will work on, they will need to learn how to work together, how to build and maintain those relationships for those things to be effective. All right, we get to the second half of the question that asks about how can the humanities reestablish its relevance. And I'm going to start at the point that has been brought up repeatedly, the fact that the arts is portrayed as synonymous with poverty. So if you are in the arts, chances are you'll end up poor, especially if you're a teacher. They, the people usually perpetuate this belief that if you're in the arts, then um, you'll be poor. So we need to change that narrative. We need to change that narrative and show the importance of being in the arts. And one of the ways we can do this is to highlight successful people in the arts, as well as to show the transferability of the skills that you develop in the arts. Because every institution that you'll need needs somebody who knows ethics, who understands philosophy, who, who knows how to communicate and those things. It's not related to the arts. It's not just something that you use in the field of the arts. It's transferable. All right, um, the other thing that we want to do is to um, ensure that the focus is on STEAM and not STEM. STEAM, and this should be from the curriculum development phase when you're considering the, de the development of a curriculum into the implementation phase where we move away, where we introduce this collaborative 
planning and it should be mandatory and time should be set aside for it. So in your timetable, within the schools and institutions, there should be collaboration with the persons from the sciences, the arts, the business to see this is a topic we're working on. What aspect of your, your curriculum can we now infuse that allow the students, teach it at the same time so the students can see the connectivity and we can model that for our students. I also want to say the last point is talking about assessment because that's my area. Assessment. I hear people talking about teaching to the test and how it is bad. Teaching to the test is not bad if the test is reflective of what we want to teach. So we know that teaching to the test is good if our test is now going to show this emphasis on C medication. Then nothing is wrong with teaching to that test. You get what I'm saying? The teaching to the test is bad if the test is limited, not if the test is encompassing all we need our students to learn. And that's where I'm going to get. Oh, the last thing is what gets measured. What gets measured gets done. People do things if they know you're measuring or looking for it. If you're not, chances are it will fall off. So that's how we have to get it into all the system. Right. OK, wonderful. OK. And we know that the thrust is that we are to be using an approach of problem-solving, project-based learning, and it integrates all of that. The four C's, all of those things work together. And so we, have to, we are having a revolution. Not only is there a fourth industrial revolution, there is an educational revolution that is taking place. All right. Now, tables seven and eight, topic E. Are the challenges being faced by the humanities external to the field only? Could the approach to teaching in the humanities be the problem? That's the question. Representatives from table seven and eight, please come. Oh, look at two of my favorite people coming up here. That's nice. Okay. Oh, wow. And now the computer decides to... Okay, so um, we had two questions. Are the challenges being faced by the humanities external to the field only? And the first thing we did was to ask, well, what are these challenges? And there are two main challenges. One, the low numbers, and two, the overemphasis on the sciences and the underemphasis on the arts. For example, students who come to Karimat to do animation have no grades in art. <laughs> um, and then we answer the question, no, the challenges are also internal. For example, we have not, as the Faculty of Humanities and Education, completely evolved to teach in innovative ways and have not made arts sexy enough. Um, however, some schools or departments, for example, Karimak, are making the effort to innovate for example, Carmack's mantra now is to become a super user of our VLE. Okay. All lecturers must be able to teach online. And so Carmack's focus now is how can we serve our future students in the virtual space? Then we answer the question, yes, the problem is also external. And we went back to that theme that's been going since um, the two speakers on reflection. We don't value thinking and reflection enough. Could it be, I asked, from our, or we asked, from our plantation economy which valued skills over thinking? And one person also noted that we are not really embracing STEM as we should. It's really a way of thinking. But perhaps the government is using STEM as a way of pushing its own agenda and in a very, and therefore limiting the way we perceive or think of STEM. So we need to move beyond a narrow view of STEM and promote thinking. So for example, are we giving our students at the primary and secondary levels the opportunity to think or are we merely over testing them? But thank you, Clavia, for adding that point about assessment. Then our second question was, could the approach to teaching in the humanities be the problem? And we said, perhaps yes. We need to find in a more innovative ways that are relevant to the learners' needs to be productive members of society. We are no longer teaching for a job or career, but rather teaching students to become problem solvers so that they will always have work. So the other tables, Mrs. Townsend. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so we had some of the same points that were related to you just now. In addition to the challenges, we saw mentorship of teachers as a challenge. We also saw the marketability of the field of humanities as a challenge. And we saw the lack of respect for humanities as against science as a challenge. Um, we also had a little discussion about how girls felt about um, content errors in the humanities as against um, the boys. And again, in the co-ed setting, what, what happens there? Sometimes it poses a challenge. Um, in terms of whether or not it is external to the field, we also shared the same view. It is not external to the field. And could the approach be the problem? We figure yes, that we really need to um, create a blend, a blended approach to the delivery of the humanities content areas. Um, one um, participant in my group shared the, um, how when she attempted to teach a Shakespeare portion of a, um, of a book, that the students really felt that, oh, this was dead, and they were ready to go to sleep, as against when she decided to speak about the history and to begin to bring the thing alive and to show them where this, this falls and how, how you could use the Creole to actually brighten the future of the learning at that time. Um, yes, we figure that, as I said, the blend, the technology, use of technology, not being the only thing, not going over to the business of science, but to create the blend, as we say. And we need to market the subject some more. We also need to adjust our teaching styles, how we teach, and um, also some emphasis to be placed on how we train teachers in the methodologies, the blended approaches to deliver the content areas. And for whatever we do to relate to real life, to make the connections with why we are learning and how we are learning. And to teach students how to find information and to use it for lifelong learning. Thank you. So the changes need to happen from here and also at the high school and the primary school levels. The whole blended learning approach is something that is not going away, that we have to accept and deal with it. Lastly, table 10. Where is table 10? You're ready, table 10? What can the School of Education do to change the perception among teachers that assisting in the supervisor, sorry, the supervision of student teachers is a bother. Welcome, Table 10. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. We agreed at our table that the School of Education and its roster for practicum was understood and regular, regularized. Everybody knew when it was happening. But to really affect the perception of teachers, we had a couple of suggestions. One, the School of Education needed to foster and facilitate intentional collaborative seminars prior to each um, practicum period. This would allow for the staff at the corporate schools to meet with members from the School of Education in order to agree on the protocols and rules. The agreement is not on the t in terms of individual agreement with lecturers, but a system-wide agreement that the SOE could follow through and that the cooperating schools and teachers could agree to and follow upon. Uh, we also believe that I in terms of the lesson planning um, models that the schools lesson plans could be synced with the models that the, that the beginning teachers are given. Mm -hmm. So that in lessening the 
um, the opposite effect. So you have the, what SOE wants and what the school has been doing, that some attempt can be made to meet in the middle to create something that will help the teacher in the cooperating school and the beginning teacher to operate more effectively. And also that um, cooperating teachers and um, beginning teachers could liaise and cooperate with ideas about practices in terms of classroom management and so on. So one of the things that I think we agreed on was this intentional meeting. It would be a very wholesome form of collaboration that would have begin to affect perception in the schools so that when practicum comes up, everybody knows where and what they are to do. Excellent. Please give all our presenters a round of applause. And I trust that we have been listening. There have been very good suggestions that have come out of this roundtable discussion reporting. And of course, Dr. McCallum tells me that there's a rapporteur taking notes for the School of Education because we don't want to come back and have the same points brought up next year. <laughs> right. So have a good rest of the day. No, no, I'm to hand over to somebody. Who am I to hand over to? Oh. <laughs> Let me hand over to the director. Somebody left a pen. It's up here. All right, so this was really, really very useful. And I know that we have been here longer than we had planned, but it really was a very useful session. And I, I, I have taken away quite a few points, and then I were there talking about what we could perhaps immediately introduce into the programs that we offer. So we really want to thank you for the participation, and we really, we intend to do more than just listen but to also carry out some of the, the suggestions that were made. Thanks again. Now, we have two other little things that we need to do before we, before we um, we're finished here. We spoke, we have to some extent um, thought through how we want to work more closely with our schools. And in fact, one of the things that we have done, and for, for a few years now, we have, we have had seminars for our cooperating teachers. But outside of that, we find that some of our cooperating teachers have really done significant work, as said by the students with whom they work. And we thought it was important for us to recognize such persons and to really say to them, that we are very happy for the way in which you have serviced our students and for the way in which you have facilitated their smooth transition to teaching. And so this time, we want to present tokens to some of these cooperating teachers who have served us. And I'm going to ask Dr. McCallum to come and Oh, it's Dr. Haynes Brown. It's not Dr. McCallum. Tashane, where are you? Excellent. I knew it wasn't me, because I didn't have the names. <laughs> so Tashane is going to come to take charge of this section for me. Good afternoon, colleagues. Good afternoon, colleagues. I know it's been a long day, but we're at the end. It's the best part. So let's look alive and cheerful, shall we? It's the good part. So at this point, we are going to be recognizing our corporate teachers who, in the eyes of the practicing teachers, were excellent in terms of being true professionals, going above and beyond that which was expected of them in helping them to grow as professionals. So we had given the students some general characteristics that they were supposed to use as a basis for selecting the corporate teachers. And such teachers... Expect, were expected to display a genuine interest in helping the corporate in, the student teacher through their practicum experience. These corporate teachers guided them through the lesson planning process, in particular interpreting the subject syllabus, in writing the lesson plans, bridging the theory practice gap, 
These carpeting teachers would have helped them in retrieving resources for teaching, such as books, materials, setting up or booking multimedia, etc., would have observed lessons, especially the research lesson, and would have provided helpful feedback to facilitate the planning of the follow-up lessons for their lesson study. So, also, these were corporate teachers who the student teachers felt did not unnecessarily hover, giving them enough space to also teach autonomously. Right? So, please note that the citations I'm about to read are using the authentic words of the corporate teachers. At this time, I'm going to invite Ms. Lisa Brown from the Department of Literatures in English to assist me with handing out the little tokens for the teachers, the corporate teachers of English language and literacy. So I'm going to read the first one. This award, the student Ken Lloyd Smith selected Mrs. Stacian Redwood Shaw from English language from the school Mona High to as the person who would have been a very good corporate teacher. Could we invite Miss Stacy and Redwood Shaw? Collect somebody's collecting on her behalf. So Ken Loy says that Mrs. Shaw, who had over 20 years of teaching experience while practicing at Mona High, was not her corporate teacher, but she, he always enjoyed observing and teaching her class. She carried herself with most professionalism and a sense of humor. We both had a similar view on how to rectify certain issues in our society and worked together to test out our little theories. And so she went the extra mile for willing students and cared deeply about youth and education on a whole. So this prize for Miss Stacy Ann Redwood. The next student was Rhea Elena Williams, and she selected Mrs. Sharika Hunter from the English Language Department of Hillel Academy. And the principal, I suspect, will collect on her behalf. And Rhea says that she selected the HOD because she facilitated all the requirements of her field experience as stipulated by the School of Education. She worked very hard to provide feedback and suggestions for the betterment of her craft. And in Rihanna's eyes, the HOD was a better example, even more than the corporate teacher. So kudos to Mrs. Sharika Hunter. Now, Ms. Cummins, our student teacher, selected Mrs. Maria Motido from English language from Alpha. I'm not sure if anybody is here to collect on her behalf. But nonetheless, we will read what was said about this corporate teacher. Ms. Matida should be recognized without a doubt because she was an excellent corporate teacher. She went beyond what was expected by planning English language literature lessons with me, reviewing lesson plans, as well as helping me with planning lessons. Even though she was not the corporate teacher for English language, she also helped with that subject area. She attended classes provided support and gave meaningful feedback as well as allowed me to have classes independently. She assisted in sharing best practices and encouraged and helped me to become a better teacher in and out of the classroom. I was not the same teacher when I left because of her help. So let us applaud Mrs. Maria Matido. The next person we would want to recognize is Ms. Cheyenne Jackson. Timali Lawrence, our student teacher, would have selected her. And she works at Immaculate Conception. And Timali says, my corporate teacher went beyond the call of duty to assist me with my professional development as a teacher. She provided me with the platform to grow. She also provided constant motivation throughout the practicum experience. Congratulations, Mrs. Jackson. And Timali is here too do his little bit as well. Thank you so much. And the last person from the language section would be Miss Nicole Ricketts from Mona Heights Primary. Is she here? And Miss Nicole Ricketts was selected by Sharian Shelton. And Sharian says Mrs. Ricketts was extremely helpful with providing meaningful feedback on the lessons she observed. She also assisted with lesson planning and the provision of resources. Congratulations as well, Ms. Ricketts. Continue to do what you're doing. Thank you very much, Ms. Brown. I appreciate it. At this time, I'm going to invite Dr.
Dr. Bramwell Layla to assist with giving out the remainder of the prizes. And we have Miss Camille Tyndale from Vauxhall. Is she here? Miss and this student's teacher, Stefina Edwards, selected Miss Tyndale. And she says that the support received from Miss Tyndale was felt greatly throughout her practicum period. She assisted with classroom management when I was not accustomed to the class. In addition, we always discussed any strengths and weaknesses observed in teaching. Congratulations and thank you, Miss Tyndale. The next person would be Miss Tenny Copeland from Campion College, also a past student of the School of Education. I would have to say that, yes. And she was selected by Lorenza Crossman. And Lorenza says Miss Copeland was an exceptional cooperative teacher with the daily support she gave. I always felt welcomed and had no issue asking for feedback on my lessons and effective ways to improve them. I appreciate her help because it made the experience one that allowed me to be fully immersed and to adapt to the school environment, classroom structure, and student. Congratulations, Ms. Copeland. Continue to do what you do. And Raymond Douglas, our student teacher, selected Ms. Arlene Lawrence from Physics from St. Hugh's High. Is she here? Somebody's collecting on her behalf. So. Raymond says that Ms. Lawrence was very helpful to me when planning lessons for the grade 9 and 10 classes. I could always go to her to get some advice on activities for the students. Please convey our congratulations to Ms. Lawrence. Thank you so much. <laughs> Shanine Spaulding, our student teacher, selected Mrs. Alinta Beecher Barham, a geography teacher from Alpha. Is she here? Not here? Okay, so I will still read nonetheless what was said about Ms. Barham. So Mrs. Barham, the geography supervisor at Alpha Academy, has played a major role during my teaching practice. She has provided me with the necessary tools and encouragement. I am truly thankful for everything, and I wish her all the best in the future. May God bless you in every way. So that's another one. Wonderful cooperative teacher again here. And Miguel Bins would have selected Mrs. Dominique Dixon Parnell, a teacher of mathematics at Tarrant High. And she's here. And Miguel says that Mrs. Dixon Parnell was an exceptional cooperating teacher in that she was always there for me to ensure that I was on the right track. She would allow, she would have gone through my plans to provide support and advice as to best practices. I am thankful to her as well because she facilitated our practical exercise as the head of department. Congratulations, continue to do what you do, Mrs. Parnell. And last but not least, we have Miss Carla Cole from Arden High. Is she here? Welcome, Miss Cole from Arden High. And Dana Doman selected her. And Dana says, Miss Cole has tremendously contributed to my personal and professional development as a teacher. She ensured that my lessons were well designed and student centered. And so, Dana says she's one of the best cooperative teachers. Thank you so much. Congratulations. And we will encourage the principals to continue to convey our, our congratulations to them and to encourage more cooperative teachers to follow the example of these who were recognized here today. And before I forget, um, all the repertoires are being asked to hand over their notes to Miss Campbell at the end. Thank you so much. Just before Dr. White comes, I need to say two things, just before cleaning some skin and I need to say a couple things. Firstly, we need you to first have a look right here before you leave, and there are a, a lot of information on all of the programs in the faculty. There are flyers that you can take. This display speaks to the practicum process, and we also have copies of the book, one of the books by Mrs. Tyson that you may want to purchase. So that said, I am now going to invite Dr. Spencer to make a, no, not brief, to make a presentation to Mrs. Esther Tyson on our behalf. You don't have to speak, you need to say something. Oh boy, okay, should we do it this way? I want you to come up, yes. 
so that everybody can take a look at you while you're standing here. <laughs> or we can turn it this way. But the way it was. Perfect. Right. Everybody can agree, yes, that it was great to have Mrs. Tyson with us today, um, that it was great to be led by her, the, the discussions, the, all the facilitating that she did. Who does this thing is always very important, yes? Um, because the person who leads it also determines the results to a great extent that we get from it. So I just wanted to really thank you for taking the time out to come here today and to share with us and to be present. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to ask, this is a spot prize, nobody knows this is happening. Mr. Anthony Grant. Mr. Grant, are you still here? Mr. Grant left? Oh dear. Well, the two persons who are going to get the spot prizes have left. These were the two principals, male and female, who were first to arrive. But we have a copy of Esther's book and we wanted them to get it. But that will be done at another point. And now, Livingston, it's your turn. Thank you, Dr. Rainford. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This was indeed a productive meeting, one that could not have been possible without the initiative, dedication, and sacrifice of key individuals. We therefore show appreciation to Dr. Rainford for the warm welcome extended and introduction made and for chairing the function this morning. Thank you to Dr. Sharon Bramwell Layla for doing the opening prayer. Dr. McCallum, thank you for providing such a detailed overview of the theme of this breakfast roundtable. A big thanks to our presenters and facilitators, Dr. Benjamin, Dr. Farkerson, Dr. Sykes, Mrs. Tyson, Dr. Carl Gentles, and Dr. Aisha Spencer. Thank you for introducing our presenters. We also thank Dr. Tashane Haynes-Brown for presenting certificates and tokens to our cooperating teachers. To the School of Education Practicum Unit, you know, the organizers of the event, the role you've played is extremely crucial and we've, we would like to extend our most sincere gratitude to you for successfully coordinating this event. All the reporters from the various roundtable discussions, I'll call the names Dr. Heath, Dr. McLaren, Dr. Kenvey, Ms. Brown, Dr. Eitel, Dr. Moore, Dr. Clavier Williams at B, Mrs. Townsend, Dr. Louis Fulcom. Thank you so much for completing your various reports in a timely fashion. We're grateful that you have successfully maneuvered reporting on your respective discussions. And the School of Education will agree with me that uh, uh, inviting the rest of the humanities faculty to the breakfast was a great idea. And we do look forward to your invitation again next year. And we also looking forward to lunch. We would like to suggest that you make it into the School of Education brunch since we're going to be here for four hours. And we need four hours to discuss this very important topic. Finally, we, and yes, how could I forget, yes, yes, the Youth Empowerment Society, thanks to the executive members, they're sitting around there, they were the ushers for today's event, showing you to your various numbered tables, that was very important. And so finally, we thank all of you who have attended and participated in this roundtable, educators and administrators from the various schools. And to show you that I learned something, you know, this, is, this was wonderful for me personally because coming back to this gathering of being with educators during my postgraduate studies, most of my analysis classes and methodology classes were done in the College of Education, although I was in the College of Communication. So it's nice to hang around educators. You learn a lot about teaching. So as I intentionally reflect on today's event <laughs> and think about how we are going to do some intensive mentoring and modeling the behavior, you know, as we try to inspire our students to build Joseph Farkerson's time machine, yes? Uh, let us continue to partner to shape the future of our students and provide them with a balanced, holistic experience while under our tutelage. Thank you so much and have a productive academic year.
dismissed. Uh. <laughs>